Well, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever time zone you're in. Um, welcome to this webinar about uh, making use of date times with uh, FME. Uh, my name's Mark Island, and I'll be a presenter today. Uh, I'm the FME evangelist at SAFE, if you've uh, not met me before. And with me is my Colin Kalin. Do you want to say hi, Kalin? Hi, I'm Kalin, and I'm an FME desktop expert as well. Okay, well, um, let's uh, move on to the next uh, slide, shall we? So we, today we're talking about dates and times. And to me, I think date time information can make your data, well, incredibly valuable, it says on screen. Um, and that's true. Uh, I think a lot of our users don't necessarily make as full a use of uh, date times as perhaps they could because they're not aware of the functionality that FME offers. Um, and there are there's so many different ways in which we can process this data and we can analyze them in different ways as well and use them in different reports and different analysis. And yeah, as it says on the side, it's time to stop wasting time. It's time to stop wasting our date times and make use of them. So that's all well, but date times can be very complicated. Um, there are multiple structures. Uh, every format seems to have its own structure. We've heard that story before. And once you start looking at date time arithmetic, that's difficult. What's one date minus the other date and comparing dates? And how do you handle the time zones and the leap years and the international date lines? Another uh, big one. So when you've got time data all over the world, um, that's when it becomes more complicated. And even if you are aware of the potential of your date time data, you you might be processing it only with a lot of manual effort. So we are here to solve that problem. Uh, I think we have some examples as well. Were you gonna go through these, Kaylin, or was I? I can't remember. Yeah, I can I can do it. So sure. when we were looking for content for the webinar, we were kind of amazed to see how many different ways that date times are used and how many different contexts. It was kind of interesting to see how they um, behave when transiting between applications as well. So we saw a lot of things like, can I make my dates human readable? Or can I tell if X year is a leap year? Are my dates ISO 8601 compliant? Does it matter what time zone I am in? Or does it matter what time zone my FME server is in? And why does this all matter? So our mission is to help you maximize the value of your data, or in this context, your date time data, so hopefully after watching this webinar, you'll understand how date times work in FME and how they can be used as an asset in your analysis. So the basics, I'm just gonna go over a date time and a date time. A date is a calendar date, a time is a clock time, optionally with a UTC offset, and then a date is a combination of both the calendar date and clock time. So interpretation. So when reading, FME will read date times and convert them to its own internal format, which is just down here in this reading box. And this is FME's standard date time format. By doing this, FME has an easier time parsing, formatting, and manipulating these kinds of values. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but I think if your dates are in the ISO format, they will not be converted to FME's internal format, but uh, I think Yeah, so, so I mean, a lot of the reading depends if FME can recognize your date time structure if you've got your own particular structure then we can't recognize it then you'll have to use a transformer but generally we will recognize it and like Kaylin said some of our transformers and uh, things inside FME will apart from recognizing FME's date time format will work on uh, ISO format as well so if your dates are in ISO format w again we can handle those directly I think I think the development team are regretting not using ISO format as our standard and having our own, but, uh, but there we go. And just if you're not aware, the ISO standard just defines what parts of a date time should appear and in what order they should appear. Yeah. Um, so when writing, FME will likely convert date times to whatever the respective application accepts. Writers are kind of set up to work end to end without the user really having to care about the format inside, but like with everything, there are always exceptions. Mm -hmm. I just I just mentioned Kaylin since um, oh. so many people said that format was a uh, was their big thing. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to emphasize that 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 point. Sorry to interrupt no. on your, your flow there, but but yeah, <laughs> as long as as long as a date is in the FME format, the FME structure, when it gets to the writer, if it needs to go into the a different structure for the writer, FME generally will 
convert that automatically. It's not like you have to do something to it. So if your date is in, say, ISO format in the start, we'll read it. We might convert it to uh, FME format in the middle. And when we write it, we will put it in the right structure. It shouldn't, that's the application obstacle we've talked about before. Really, the key of FME is to try and remove those obstacles and do that smoothly and automatically. So I just really wanted to emphasize that because, yeah, so many people said that was the big issue for them. And Thanks. if it's not, then you use, need to use a transformer, and Kaylin's going to show that as well. Sorry, I'm, I'm butting in, <laughs> but go, go no. ahead, Kaylin. No, the more, the more the better. Okay, so these exceptions we commonly see with the databases. So I'm sure Oracle you've heard mentioned or Snowflake. And all this means is that it's going to require a little more ceremony when writing date times to these formats. Um, they just probably take a proprietary structure that you have to kind of accommodate. Why? Underneath, I, I'm pretty sure they store data as seconds since UTC epoch, which means they store date times as a number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. I'm not totally sure why, but that's why. I, I guess then maybe it's easier to store in a just as yeah. a single number rather than but, optimized or something. Yeah, but they want to show it in a way that people can understand. So I guess that's why they they don't ask you for that as input. Sorry. So these are <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> these are the three date time transformers that we offer in FME. So we have the date time converter, the date time calculator, and stamper. The converter, like Mark said, will convert formats from one to another date time formats from one to another. The calculator performs arithmetic either on or between date intervals. And then the timestamper just takes a timestamp of now and stores it in a new attribute. So understanding format string flags, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but this is just how we reference different parts of date time. Format string flags are just abbreviated expressions used to represent individual parts of a date time format. Oh, and actually this uh, this screenshot came from the quick reference section in the daytime converter, but we have an expanded uh, version in our documentation too, which I think we can link out. Yeah. I forgot to ask the development team whether those are standard flags as well as, or whether we made our own up. I think they're pretty standard ones though, so I'm not sure. I would standard. imagine, but cool to check. Yeah, I should have asked, but. Um, so this is the date time stamper. This is probably one of the easiest transform or date time transformers you'll use. And so on the left, I'm taking a timestamp in UTC time, and on the right, I'm taking a timestamp in local time, and I'm applying an offset. So the difference between UTC and local time, UTC or coordinate universal time, is a global standard based on zero longitude, and it's pretty much the time standard that regulates date times on a global scale, kind of literally like a universal clock. So I believe that it's used for the International Space Station and any other uh, kind of events that happen on a global scale like that. And unlike local time, UTC time doesn't have to be adjusted for daylight savings. So what's local time? Local time is the standard local time of where you are, and it's more or less based off the sun's location. Technically, we should call it local standard time because it's been standardized into time zones, and those time zones offset values are defined from their offset from UTC time. Okay, uh, so more powerful together. So when these transformers are used in conjunction with one another, not only can we take a date timestamp of now, but we can use a date time converter to make it human readable as well. So it makes it a little more digestible for the audience. Now we're gonna jump into some advanced examples and then I'll hand it over to Mark to blow you away with some really cool examples. The first one is a tree inspection demo, and I just created a small scenario and then I'll hop into Workbench. So here we're gonna use daytime transformers to monitor tree inspection requirements for planted trees in the Vancouver, BC area. Inspections are required every 10 years a tree is lived. Here inspections are used to report disease, infestation, or damage, or maybe if it was a logging company checking for yield value or age. Okay, so I did pre-build this example um, just for the sake of time. Can everyone see Workbench? Mark, can you see Workbench? I can see Workbench. Maybe Perfect. you can zoom in slightly just so it's a bit easy to see. I'm not sure what resolution your screen is, but... Uh... Is this better? Yep, absolutely, yeah. Okay. So first, let's read in the data and let's identify our date time attribute. I'm just going to close this. <clears throat> 
so we have tree ID, address, but we can tell that planting date is going to be our daytime attribute. So from here, we're going to use a daytime calculator, and we're going to use the mo calculate intervals between date times because we want to know how long the tree has been planted. So our start date is going to be the planting date, which we're going to navigate down with our drop arrows. And then we're going to want to measure pretty much up until today's date. We're looking for 10 years a tree has been planted, so the result type is going to be in years, and we're going to store this variable in total years planted. And before you click OK, Kaylin, can you, oh, yeah. sorry. Can no, you show I haven't. Me, there's other options on there um, to get the result type. So yeah, you can get an ISO standard curation as well, which is like, will tell you like, it's like P, the number Y, which is like the number of years, number of months, days, hours, seconds, minutes, if you want. It's all oh, in so one string. Like countdown. Yeah. Yeah, Just because I did my conditional values with the year mm -hmm. value, I don't know how it's going to handle the fractions. We'll keep going. Yeah. But that's cool. Um, and so as we can see, we just have our calculated total years. I'm going to clean this up with an attribute rounder. And you don't have to do that. That's totally up to you. And then the next few steps, I'm just creating an empty attribute to hold a, a simple yes or no. Is an inspection required? An attribute manager is being used to test for conditional values. So is the tree implanted for more than 10 years? Yes or no? And then this is just testing for action. So obviously, there's a lot of trees to be inspected. but I didn't finish this example. We could write it to a Agle or ArcGIS Online feature service, or maybe we could write it to a report and have this emailed out um, to our tree inspectors. But um, that is the first demo. Yeah, that's okay. a good one. Thanks. And you could have used a date time stamper there, I guess. But I, instead, yeah. instead, you put a function into the uh, date time calculator. And we'll look at that shortly. I just wanted to. Uh, yeah, you talk about functions. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah. Okay, so this is the next example. It kind of does the same arithmetic as the first one, so I'm not going to be in Workbench for this one. I'm just going to talk it through very briefly. So we're reading a CSV with two birth dates. We're using the attribute uh, manager to use the date time function, which Mark just mentioned, to get the date time now. We're using the date time converter to align the formats, and then we're calculating again here between intervals, and we're just getting the result in our attribute manager. So those are the results. So yeah, these... we, now oh, we know who's older. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it is, isn't it? <laughs> we need uh, to have. Anyway, yeah. no, I was going to say we need to have calculators like, could I be old enough to be your father? Could I be old enough to be your <laughs> grandfather? I'm like, we'd have to calculate that, but it's on the edge. That can be a <laughs> webinar 2.0. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, so my last example is uh, just being able to tell if something is a leap year or not. I thought this is kind of a cool example because we can use the user parameter manager window, which is a feature in 2021.0. And so I'm going to jump into a workspace with this user parameter already built and then just build out the workspace. But I wanted to identify this here that I'm actually not using the date time option, although some people might be inclined to think that. I'm just using the number option so we can control the user's input. So it actually lets me set lower and upper limits. Um, but yeah, I thought I should identify that. And I'm going to pull up Workbench. So just to show you, I have this already created. And then from here, what we're going to do is test for a leap year. So we're going to add an attribute manager and create two dates. And typically, there's 365 days in a year. So we're going to have start date and end date. And so if a leap year, uh, sorry, if a year is a leap year, it means that it has 366 days. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to subtract two uh, values and see if we have one day left or two days left remaining in the year. So we're going to subtract 
um, pretty much from February 28th to March 31st. So, or sorry, oh, not 31st, the first. <laughs> and we can run, actually, we will wait to run. And date time calculator. And we're going to calculate interval between dates again, start date, end date. And we're going to look for the days because we want to know if there's two or one days. We want to see if there's 365 or 66. So I know that 2024 is a leap year, but we can test with both values. And so we have the result of two, so that's 366 days. Now, if I wanted to create a tester, we could add this in and have this kind of a little more manual, or sorry, just done automatically for us, so two. And then if it passed, it's a leap year. And if it doesn't, it's not. So we can try this example again. Um, with 23 and see if it works, which I don't think it should. Awesome, so 2023 is not a leap year. Okay, and I think that concludes the advanced exam. Could you just go back to that workspace a second? Kayleigh? Absolutely. And look at the tester transformer. Um, uh, there was something I just wanted to uh, highlight there. Here we go. Sure. In, in the tester, yeah. So when you look down, there's a comparison mode, and if you mm -hmm. click on that, one of the options is date time. So the tester will actually test specifically dates and times. You could say, does this date equal that date, or is it greater than that date? Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. It's, I was uh, aware of that. Yeah, it's nice how they built that into the uh, the tester, because that's one of the things we really want to do sometimes, is compare one date to another. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's one way you can do that. So yeah, date times are built into a lot of transformers, not just the uh, not just the three main uh, date time transformers that we should be. Yeah, that's a good point too. Yeah. Date time functions. Okay, so I'm just going to present quickly on date time functions, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about those. So, what are FME? Let's look at FME functions in general. FME functions are tools that carry out specific tasks. Um, they're often equivalent to a standard transformer. So where we've got a transformer uh, like the area calculator, calculates the area of a polygon, we'd also have an FME function that uses that that can calculate the area as well. And basically, the, off, very often the transformer is based on the function. So it, it's like a lower level of transformer, if you like. Um, what can you do with these functions? Well, you can use them inside expressions. You can use them inside all sorts of uh, transformer parameters as well. So there's lots of places we can use these functions. Why do we do that? When you've, well, when you've got, already got the transformer, you don't need to do this. But many people do because it reduces workspace clutter. Instead of having a, like five or six transformers to do something, you can put everything all inside a single transformer. And it makes it more condensed. It's, maybe a little less readable. Somebody else could look at it and it would be harder for them to work out what was happening, but you're saving a lot of real estate on the uh, FME canvas. And here are some examples. So like I mentioned, there's an FME feature function called area, which measures area. There's string functions, there are math functions, but importantly for us today, there are date time functions as well. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at today. And in particular, I'm going to look at a demonstration now, which um, we're going to set up a field in a workspace to write the last updated date. And we're going to use multiple FME functions, and we're going to get a timestamp in the correct format with the time zone set. So let me switch over to Workbench. And I was, let's see, I've got to find where we are. Date time webinar, date time functions. Let's start with the beginning workspace. 
So I've got this workspace here, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit just to give you a bit of better view. So we're reading from a data set and we're writing to a different data set. And you'll notice the one on the output has uh, an area field added and a, a last update field added. Um, and if we look at the user attributes, we can see that the park area is set to a, a real number and the last update is set to a date time. And what's the attribute manager doing? Well, the attribute manager so far is calculating the area with the area function in here. So we could have used an area calculator transformer, but we've put the function directly in here. Um, so how could I set the last update date? Well, I could just put a date time stamper in there. And I could say calculate that and write it out to last update. And there we go. And that would work fine. So for the basics, yeah, that's great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add that into the attribute manager. And I'm going to say, let's create a new attribute called last update. Well, it even prompts me. Is that the one I want? Yes, it is. I'm going to open up the text editor dialog. And you can see on the left hand side, we've got math functions, string functions, the FME feature functions like the area calculation. And at the bottom of there, we've got date time functions. And the one, what I want to do is I want to get the date time now with the date time stamper equivalent. And there's a date time now function. But I also want to format that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the date time format first. So I'm just going to double click on the date time format function. Why am I doing it first? Well, because then it automatically highlights the date time part. And now I just double click date time now, and that's plugged in. So, okay, so we're taking the date time right now, we're formatting it, and now I can put the format that I want. So let me see, what am I going to do? I think we're going to go with percent A, percent B, percent D. See, this, this is something you, you need to know these flags if you're going to try and use them inside functions. But one of the other things you can do is look under the help. And there's a help window down there, and it says, tell me about date time functions. And that'll pop up. And here we go. It tells us all about the date time functions and what they do and what the different flags are as well. So the help is all, always there, whether you're doing functions or whether you're in a transformer. So I'm just writing these down because I know what these are. So yeah, so percent A and percent B, it's like the weekday, the day of the week, the, the month, the year, at, instead of H, I'm using I, which I guess is a 12 hour clock instead of 24. And again, this is all possible in transformers. I could have used the date time stamper and the date time formatter. I'm just deciding to put them all into here. Now, somebody was asking earlier about what, how do I get rid of uh, fractional seconds? How do I get rid of the fraction in the seconds? Well, there isn't uh, an option that I know of in the formatter or the date time now function, but there is a math function called int which I can use just to turn it into an integer or round if I wanted to round it off. Um, so I'm going to use the integer function. Now the question is, where should that integer function go in here? And the first time I tried this, I made a mistake and said, I'm going to put it into, I'm going to put it around here, around the seconds part, because that's what I want to make as an integer. But that's really not where it should go, because that's just the flag. What I really want to do is make the date time that's returned an integer. So I'm going to put this around the date time now function. So in other words, return the date time right now as an integer, then convert it into that format. Um, okay. And and so why would we use these again when we've got transformers? Again, I can condense everything down into that single string. I don't have to use three or four transformers to get that result. So now I can run that workspace 
and I can just check here and we see that we have the last update, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, I'm writing that as a date time field, which is probably wrong because XML is, that's not an ISO standard there. Um, I would probably turn that into a string um, just because, um, just because Thursday, July 8th, 2021 at 1037 is not a, a valid ISO date. But if I, if I did have an FME standard date time and I said, write it to an ISO date time, it would be fine with that. So maybe what I could do just to prove that is I could change that to a string, well, a character, not a string. I'm just gonna, 64 characters and we can do last update ISO and that will be a date time. And I'm just gonna throw a date time stamper down here just to show that this is working. There we go. So if I run that now, we should see that we get a date time in the FME format still, it's still 2021, 07, 08, blah, blah, blah. But when we look at the output, we should find that that's in the ISO standard. Uh, or it might be in the output, it might be an ISO standard, it might be FME, um, <laughs> because we're reading it back with FME, FME is probably converting it back into an FME structure. But in the GML itself, I would hope that it is written in uh, ISO standard. So anyway, that's how uh, that works. Okay, so we have those functions there. The next thing we're gonna look at is the time windower. And the time windower is not really one of the, the core date time transformers but it's a, a different one, a different way of handling dates and times. Um, it groups features together based on a date time um, and it sort of creates windows. So you say, okay, I'd like to split my data up into one hour periods or five minute periods or something like that. And originally we did this to help read real time data streams. And that's really what predominantly what it's for but we can also use it for processing features in groups outside of a stream. Um, the, the, the thing is, it, it sometimes requires a bit of a careful setup, especially when you're live streaming data, because you want to make sure that the, the workspace is passing the information correctly uh, and at the right place at the right time. So it does take a bit of setup for that scenario, but uh, we'll have a quick look at that as well. So I've got two scenarios here. One of them is we're gonna update a weather forecast every 15 minutes based on live wind speed data. So we're gonna say, hey, we're at an airport. Every 15 minutes, we have to give a new wind speed um, information, but we've got wind speed coming from the, uh, the sensor outside every few seconds. So how are we gonna do that? And then the other one I'm gonna do is not as live stream of data. It's gonna be a, a data set of parking tickets and say, well, how are we gonna group this into say seven day intervals. So let's have a look at that. So I've got two examples in here. And the first one is the streaming example. And I just made this up, so we're not gonna be able to run this, but it, this is how it would look in your workspace. So we're kicking the workspace off by just hitting a creator transformer and that just says start the workspace. This transformer is an MQTT connector. Basically, that's a message uh, handling uh, service online, and it's sending, it can send records to a workspace, and the workspace will keep running and keep receiving those records uh, in real time. And I just made this up completely. I don't have a URL to, to run with, uh, but that's how it would work. And other formats are supported as well. It's like a TCP IP connector, a receiver and sender. So quite often anything that's called a something receiver will be waiting for things to come. So you can say, 
oh, a WebSocket receiver. We're, we're sending data from a sensor via WebSockets. We can listen on that WebSocket and we can pull the data in in a real time stream. So I've got a stream of data coming in as messages, but I don't want to output new wind speed information every time I get a sensor reading. I want to take that 15 minute period and calculate the average. So how do I do that? How do I say, we'll wait for 15 minutes and then do this? Well, what we've got here is a time window a transformer. And the time window says, okay, well, the setting is every 15 minutes. As soon as the workspace starts, start counting, well, 15 minutes are up, then tag all the features that are come in with window number one and pass that on to the next transformer. And at the same time, when all the other data that's coming in, after that 15 minutes, I'm holding it there and saying, okay, this data gets held. This is going to be window number two, and we'll pass it on when the next 15 minutes is up. And it could be 15 minutes, 15 seconds, 15 days, whatever I want. Um, so yeah, so I run that every 15 minutes, it outputs that data and it sends it to the, the statistics calculator. And the statistics calculator, this is where one of the reasons we have to be a little bit careful in this scenario. We say group by the window ID. So in other words, every record that has the same window ID, find out the average value of the wind speed and find out the maximum value of the wind speed. So everything that comes in the first 15 minute window, do this calculation, send the data out. The next window comes in, do that and send it out. Normally, a, a group by transformer doesn't do that. Normally, it holds the data as long as it can, waiting just in case there's more information for the group. So it's important to set the group by mode to say, whenever the group changes, spit the records out. So in other words, as soon as we get the next record from window two, we're obviously done. So window one can go out and that can be our latest contract. So that's what the time windower is doing. It's basically creating little windows little periods of time and tagging the data with it. And the one example I can run is this one here. So what are we doing here? Well, I'm reading some parking ticket data and the parking ticket data has got a date on it. And so I'm reading that date and converting it to an FME format because right now the, the date is in the structure month, day, year with a slash between it. So I've gone into there and I've manually defined the input format. Um, we can pick a, a known format from the list, but if I don't know the input format or I know it doesn't match one of those, I can just type it into the field directly. So I've said, okay, it's coming in in this format, output it to me in an FME format, sort the data into date order. And that's one of the great things about using the, uh, the FME date time format is it's sortable uh, whereas I don't think the ISO standard would work quite the same way. So we can sort the date into, because it's a numeric value, we can sort it that way. And then the time window says, okay, instead of creating a timestamp like the previous example did, you've already got a timestamp, so I'm going to use that to divide the data up. And we're saying every seven days worth of data, output it to a new window. So it's not like it's waiting seven days as the above time windower does, because the above time windower is saying, okay, I'm gonna have to timestamp this. The, uh, this time windower says, oh, you've already got a timestamp, I'm gonna use that. So we can see from my source data, the date was 2nd of the 1st, 2016. We convert it to an FME structure. We sort that into there and we output with a time window. And so what we should find is, okay, we start counting at zero, not one. So window number zero is the first week of the year. And somewhere around the seventh or the eighth of the month, it should change. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're on the eighth. I'm just scrolling back up. Wow, there were a lot of parking tickets on the eighth. There we go. So the seventh of the month is window zero, the eighth of the month is window one. And that way we can basically split our data up 
And at that point, I could do all sorts of things. Like, again, I could calculate statistics and do a group by, or I could do a fan out and write it to different sheets on a spreadsheet according to the time window and so on. Now, if, you, if you're looking at this, you might say, oh, well, couldn't I just do that by calculating the week of the year using the date time converter? I could just say, well, tell me, tell me what week of the year it is. Um, there's a way of doing that. A week of the year, percentage W. Couldn't I just get the same thing using percentage W? And yes, okay, I could do that. But the idea of the time window here is I could change this. So if I could say, actually, I only want every five days, or I want every uh, 24 hours, I want a new window. And so that's how we can, uh, that, that's where the flexibility comes in of the time window. So yeah, so that's what the time window does. Um, what are we going to look at next? Well, this is my final demo for today, and we're going to look at some FME hub transformers, and we're going to use them, and we're going to use what we've done so far, and we're going to put everything all together um, and give a sort of final result. So what is the hub? Well, the hub, if you're not aware of it, is a website that we have where we can store transformers, formats, and tools like coordinate systems and the like. And basically, you can use those to extend the, your capabilities of your FME. Um, and we, at Safe Software, we put things on the hub for you to use, but other users can put their own things on there as well. So you can create your own transformer and put it onto the hub. And then you can just use it inside a workspace however you like. And that's the demo we're going to do right now. We're going to calculate the landing time of an aircraft in the local time of landing given the local time of departure and the flight time. So let's have a look at that. And again, it's a pre-made uh, workspace, um, but I'm, I'm just gonna show it to you rather than put it together just because it's a bit quicker. So what have we got here? Well, we've got, I'm creating a point that's in Los Angeles airport. I'm creating a point that's in Sydney airport. And you'll see we've got these time zone extractor transformers. Well, what are they? Well, they came from the FME hub. If I flip back to my web uh, page, I can go to the FME hub and basically I can look at this and say, oh, look, here's, here are all these different transformers that are available, like natural language processing. There's an advanced sampler there uh, and, and so on. But if I do a search, like if I type for date, I find a whole bunch of date related ones like relative date calculator. So what, how many days is it till last Thursday would be a relative date. Um, there's a working days calculator. I know that. Uh, there's a date time exploder. I think I mentioned that it takes a date time and splits it up into its individual parts. Uh, previous Saturday calculator, the, the next Monday calculator, um, working days calculator, that's, that's one that I did, uh, tells you the difference between two dates in the number of working days. Um, there's even one on here, and this is, this is me because I have a bit of obsessions about date times. Sundial calculator, hey, you want to create a sundial? You can do that with this transformer. It'll calculate it and it'll calculate a template that you can print out and create a sundial from. So, so yes, yeah, so this is the hub. There are lots of things on there. And one of the things is this time zone extractor, which says I can take a point in the world and pick out what time zone it's in. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm picking out Los Angeles and I'm picking out Sydney in Australia and I'm finding what the time zone they're in. So Los Angeles is in the Pacific daytime, daylight savings time. It's minus 28,800 seconds from UTC, so eight hours behind. But you can see there's a daytime offset of 3,600 seconds, i.e. one hour, because we're in summertime. And we get the same thing with Sydney. That's 3,600 seconds in front, so 12 hours, I guess. And there's no daylight savings times offset because they're not in daylight savings time. So I've got those two positions. I've created a line between them. What am I going to do now? I'm going to calculate 
uh, if a flight took off from Sydney at a certain, from uh, LA at a certain time, what time would it land in Sydney? So I've got some published parameters actually. If I turn on the prompt and hit the run button, have I got user parameters? Yeah, I should be prompting there. Let's do rerun, there we go. So I can pick what time it takes off, like 11 o'clock on the 3rd of June, it takes 15 hours and two minutes to fly. What time will it land in Sydney? So we're saying, take the local date time, add the journey length to it in hours and minutes. That's the time it'll land in Sydney in Los Angeles time. Now we need to convert that to Sydney time. And this is where I use functions because the date time uh, functions for time zones, you can only use inside a function. There's no transformer to do that. So I say, set the time zone, take the landing time as it is in the LA time and convert it to the next time zone on our list, which was Sydney time. So now I can look at the output from there and say, okay, the, the let's see, destination landing time is, and it will tell me that there. And all I'm doing with this last few bits is making it more readable to the human eye. So we say, well, let's break it so I can actually understand that without trying to figure out the numbers. And it'll tell us the destination landing time, 5th of June at 7.02 a.m. And the orthodrome replacer, that's another hub transformer. Um, that replaces a line between two points with a uh, an orthodrome, basically the, the uh, uh, what do we call it? It's not a great circle route, or it sort of is a great circle route. It's the shortest line between these points. And then I just write it out to a HTML report, which I can have a quick look at. And this is it. So we say, hey, I wrote it out. We're flying from Los Angeles to Sydney. If we took off from LA on the 3rd of June, 11 o'clock at night, and it took 14 hours, three minutes, then you would land at the 5th of June, 702. Why is it two days later? Well, one of the reasons is because it's gone over the midnight period from 11 o'clock at night to seven in the morning. That's the midnight period. So that's one reason. But the other reason is it's passed over the date timeline as well. And again, FME could figure out that difference. It, it knew the date time line was there, the international date line, and it knew the difference between midnight and the day after and it calculated it as being that time of landing. And we can confirm that work because I can look things up on uh, like FlightAware, which this is how I tested it. I said, oh, well, I wonder what, if this will work. So I take the takeoff time in LA, the landing time in Sydney, take the, uh, the total traveling time, run that through, and we get the same landing time as they get. So I know it's worked here. That's cool. Yeah, um, I did. Uh, create a an app that you can use if you felt like using it and maybe I'll just chat that link out if I can find the chat link so I turned that into a server workspace put it onto server made it an app and if you follow that link you will get to this page and you can you can try this out you can pick a place on the map, you can pick a landing place on the map, you can say how long it will take to fly between the two and hit OK and it will tell you what the landing time is. So there you go. Right, yes, we should probably get back to the um, presentation because there's not a lot left. We've, we've done all the demos now. Um, really, the whole point of this was to show how you can increase the value of your data by using date times and by showing the different things that you can do in FME, how you can handle the time zones with the time zone functions, how FME will automatically handle certain things. One of the keys to handling the date times is as long as you've got the UTC offset set on your times, FME can calculate the difference between them and it will take that into account. So that's really uh, one way of doing that. It's, it's, it's really useful. And yeah, you can add so much value to date times by doing arithmetic, doing conversions of the structure, all sorts of things. Uh, and FME can certainly help you there. There was one other thing I think you wanted to talk about this, Kaylin. Um, yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting when I stumbled upon it. 
Um, mm-hmm. So just because of continental drift, so continental drift, the speed that this is happening, Google told me it was about 2.5 centimeters a year. But due to the drift of the continents, there's a growing shift between different coordinate systems. So now they're starting to kind of consider time as an aspect in coordinate systems. So it might be like X, Y, Z, T. Um, yeah. That would be kind of cool to know. Yeah, I think uh, in Australia especially, they've got the Good Day 2020. Um, yeah, GDA. Uh, GDA, yeah. I think they pronounce it, well, yeah, you think GDA 2020, <laughs> and then you realize, oh, it's Good Day. <laughs> Good day. Might, yeah, I think they might have done that on purpose, but um, anyway, <laughs> yes, because Australia is drifting, I think, a lot faster than other people, other countries, and so they figured they needed to do something. And I think the 2020 was the baseline, and from now on, basically, you don't need to record just where something is, but you need to say when it is, and then there's Proj library, which should be able to convert and take the Earth's surface motion into account as well. And uh, FME does support the Proj library. It's got a Proj reprojector uh, transformer. Uh, I haven't tried it using the, the dates and the times as well, but I'm hoping it would work. So, yeah. Kind of curious to see how that'll work, actually. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I, I, I think it's going to be important. One of the things... One of the big examples I read somewhere was somebody trying to build a bridge between two oil rigs, I think, and they'd surveyed the positions of the rigs in 1970. And of course, the Earth's surface had moved them apart slightly since then. And so even though the coordinates were correct, the the Earth had moved, so the things had moved and the bridge didn't fit. I heard another example like that about a logging uh, company and I guess they clear cut into like a park. (laughs) A few kilometers Ooh. into a park, yeah, it was pretty, Yikes. pretty iffy example, but it's yeah. funny. Awesome. So, Asa, thank you for joining us today. You can claim your community badge, and I will leave the link in the chat now. And we do have some time for Q and A. And if you haven't had a chance to ask your question, you can ask them now in the question panel. And I will pass it over to Mark and Kaylee. So are there any questions that we want to address live? I think I think so, yeah, we can do that. Kaylin, was there any I think I see you highlighted a few uh questions that you were were interested in. Did you want to pick one of those to uh Yeah, sure. So I created a little list here actually. So uh the first one is why is the two digit year not available for reading? Mark, yeah, did you I, want to... I didn't I didn't realize I didn't know about this one so uh, I, I I think I answered the question wrong twice but um but you can you can explain about that uh sure yeah so let me just find my link here so I can um convey properly so I think we can read in a four year uh four digit years but they'll be read in as a string Um, But there is a trick to getting the attribute manager to convert to two-year, two-digit years, if that's what you wanted. Um, But I don't think that's possible in FME alone. Like, you'll have to trick the attribute manager to doing it for you. Um, But I think that's because some of the daytime transformers or functions have have issues parsing or figuring out which one is the year when it's just two digits. Yeah, I can imagine that. I mean... We, we receive a string of numbers and sometimes the schema tells us that it's a date and so oh, okay well that's a date but sometimes we don't really know that and and even if we do is it a two-digit year four-digit year is it date time or just date uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to tell automatically i guess i guess that's a bit of an issue uh, so you might notice that with the csv reader as well um, sometimes you have a date and it reads it as a string because it doesn't recognize that it's a date or it, sometimes you have a number and it reads it as a date because it thinks oh that that number looks like a date i think we'll we'll, we'll say that's a date and uh, so yeah we we try and do the best we can but there, there are definitely some uh limitations there's so many different date formats it's hard to uh, 
to understand them all, I guess. Problem there. There was another question for how do you format a time to show AM or PM, which I thought this was kind of cool because I didn't know this was possible. I think there's a percent uh, lowercase p as a string flag that you can add AM or PM. Yeah, I think there is. And um, I, I think the thing with that is you only get the uppercase AM or PM. So I think I was trying to create strings with a lowercase and um, I, I I couldn't get that to, to happen. So I had to use a string case converter. But yes, the percent P tells you if it's uh, AM or PM, which is very useful. Um, Will there be any yeah. improvements to the SQL creator executor transformers to better automatically identify daytime fields? Um, Currently, don't they don't. Pick up the... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Because, yeah, uh, sorry. I'm... Uh, they don't pick up the date time from the column. And um, I think we, we, we definitely got a project on right now to improve how we handle date times in terms of the data type. And that's actually like going on now. I just saw it yesterday. Was uh, It was kicked off yesterday. So I know that's going on right now. Whether it's for those specific transformers, I really don't know. But uh, we are definitely uh, on a quest to uh, make sure that if we know something's a date time, we pass that all information all the way through and to, to recognize date times easier. So yeah, well, uh, we're definitely on, on the ball there. And I, I did notice there was one other question about using what, well, there were quite a few questions actually about um, time zones and how do you apply a time zone to your date time? Because uh, you can, like I, I'm actually in the central time zone, but I'm working with date in dates that are in the Vancouver time zone and I'm working on a virtual machine that has a server based in the Eastern time zone. And so things get a little bit uh, complicated uh, like that. So what generally I think we would do is we would suggest use a date time stamper to uh, get a UTC time zone. And that's sort of a definitive date time with no offset. And then you can apply an offset to that depending on which time zone you want it to be in. Uh, for example, well, actually, there's a function called time zone set that you can use. No transformer for that, unfortunately, but yeah, that function is there that you can use in the attribute manager and uh, wherever to to actually set the time zone on a on a an untime zoned or a, or a UTZ, UTC thing. So that um, yeah, so that function is one to remember. And I think I've got a link to an article. There's a whole um, tutorial on the FME uh, community about uh, date times. And I'm just going to chat a link out. And that one's um, a pretty good one. It talks about how to convert a date time to a local time zone and things like that. And, um, and really, that last example I showed, the um, the one with the airlines, like calculating the, the date time and offset of landing. Really, that's just a, a demo of how you do that. Uh, I don't think that it, that uh, project was really a practical tool that you'd, you'd use, um, but it, it, it was a very good example of, well, if I take off in one time zone and I land in another time zone and the flight time is this, well, how do we sort of juggle all those numbers to uh, to calculate the uh, right time. And uh, so that, that was a good example of that. Were there any other questions you wanted to highlight, Kaylin? Uh, I don't think so. Um, there's one about an interval can be fractions, uh, 10 days, three hours, 14 minutes, Etc. Um, as a decimal, I think if you had your date times formatted as a decimal already, or like as a fraction, and then you added them and used them in the date time calculator, you would get a decimal output as well. Or if you change the result type to that uh, interval ISO duration type, then I think you would get the like 10 days, three hours, 14 minutes, 20 seconds. Yeah. I think that's all the questions though. Yeah, I did notice there was another 
Well, a couple more came in since we started talking. Um, one was I have a date field and a time field stored as text and need to map one column stored as date and time concatenated. That should be fairly straightforward to just use a string concatenator transform or something like that, or an attribute manager just to concatenate those together. And if you need to adjust the format, you can use some of the date time functions at the same time. So you could say in the attribute manager, <coughs> excuse me, open up, a, create a new attribute, open up the text editor and say, this is going to be at date time format, original date time, and then the just add the time field onto the end of that as well. And that should map it all to the same field. So I think that should be fairly straightforward. Yeah, and, and there was just a comment about recognizing a date field. Um, <laughs> I think that I think that more, I just read that again, and I, I guess that's a joke. It says some people the glass is half empty, some people the glass is half full. For Microsoft Excel, the glass is second of January. So that's uh, yeah, that just made me laugh there. I like that one. Yeah, pretty funny. Um. I was I was almost about to answer that as a serious question, and then I suddenly like, oh yeah. Um, yeah, I think that was pretty much all of the uh, the, the questions we uh, we had there. Well, there was one other about the time window as well. If it would need to be running on server and taking up an engine, depends on what you were doing with it. I mean, you, technically, yeah, you could run it on desktop and it would be fine. That's, that's not a problem. Um, just if you run it on server, you get all of the additions uh, like um, alerts and, and things like that and whatever. And then you can dedicate an engine to it and that sort of thing. So um, usually we, we expect to do that sort of thing on uh, on server because it's the only thing that's got the power to, uh, to handle incoming streams of data like that. But, uh, and if you're using dynamic... Uh, licensing i'm not sure what they call it dynamic credits you don't get charged while that workspace is running only when it's actually running and processing data so that would uh, that's a benefit there of that but i think that's all i had um Aileen, anything from you uh all clear here excellent yeah, so I think we can uh, wrap up now. So we have our 2022 user conference coming in August, and you can assess the link to register in the chat. We also have a lot of uh, upcoming and on-demand webinars on our website, so just make sure to check that out. All the results to these webinars will also be posted on our website later today. Yeah, so thank you to everyone who joined our webinar today and also to our presenters. Uh, I will leave the webinar open for a few minutes longer just in case any questions come in or if you just want to save any links from the chat. And we will send out the recordings and the slide of this webinar uh, later today. And if we are not able to answer your question during the webinar, we will follow, follow up with you with an email. So hope you all have a great rest of your day and thank you so much for attending.